Welcome to The Cynical Developer, the podcast that helps you to improve your development knowledge and career through explaining the latest and greatest in development technology and providing you with what you need to succeed as a developer. We've recently launched our Patreon page, which can be found at cynicaldeveloper.com forward slash Patreon. If you aren't familiar with Patreon, it's an easy way for those who are interested in this show to help out by simply pledging a small amount each month in sponsorship. Now that could be as little as $5 a month, which is about £3.80, or as much as you like. You will enable us to dedicate more time creating more content to help you, including videos, more blog posts, and even more shows. So if you can, head over to cynicaldeveloper.com forward slash Patreon and get involved. In this episode, I want to discuss securing your code. I'm going to mention a few points which are really the basics um, that I still see people getting wrong pretty much every day. Now, uh, one of the quotes I like to uh, to put out there with this is, failure to prepare is to prepare to fail. So if you're not going out there and actively making sure that your software is secure, then it's not going to be secure. And the problem with that is it's not going to be a problem until it is a problem and it's a lot harder to uh, to deal with. So it's uh, it's very good to, to have that mindset to... Um, think about it before it happens and uh, for me leaving security holes in your software is not acceptable at all at any level that you're at in your uh, in your career so uh, bear that in mind but before we get into that I would like to uh, extend my thanks to uh, to Arlene Andrews uh, for her great review on Podchaser um, and also to our newest patron Alejandro Ramon Fernandez, and I apologise if I just butchered your name, Um, but thank you very much, and uh, thank you to everyone who is supporting the podcast, either via Patreon or via your reviews or anything like that. If you haven't posted a review, then please do, you know, go post it on Podchaser, iTunes, Stitcher, whatever platform that you use, because it all goes a long way, and it also helps get the cynical developer in front of all the developers that uh, that might find it uh, useful. So, anyway... On with securing your code. And what we'll start with is uh, testing your UI. Now, I have touched on testing quite a bit when I've done my uh, monologue episodes, but this is uh, another another step on this. Now, this goes for all development. You should be ensuring that all your input fields only accept the data they are intended to take. But more importantly, I've placed this first as this is the easiest place for people to start abusing your website. If you don't validate the inputs, malicious users can use the classic exploit of SQL Server injection to obtain, alter, even destroy your data, and you, you don't really want that. So the simple steps really to, uh, to stop this from happening are validating your inputs, both on the user side and on server side as well. So ensure the length, type, format of the data is all correct and as you expect it. Check for illegal characters that shouldn't appear in the submitted data. And, you know, I noticed there that I said user-side and server-side. Many people implement the user-side validation, the JavaScript validation. Fantastic. But more often than not, they either forget to or they just don't bother and don't think about implementing the server-side of it. And that, that, that is, once you receive that information on your server-side code is to actually check again to make sure that it's still legitimate. Now, why is that important? Because all I need to do is to edit the local JavaScript or the markup using the likes of the developer tools in Chrome, and then all of a sudden your validation no longer fires, and I can submit whatever data I want. So if you haven't added a check to your server-side code, and I've just sent the SQL command to drop your users table, and boom! Your website's down. Let's hope you've got a backup. You have got a backup, right? <laughs> um, another one that uh, I see quite a lot. Now, say you've put some validation in there, or you haven't put any validation in there, but it breaks your system, is throwing that error message back to user. Don't feed back the exact error to the user. It's very easy to overlook. And um, it's very easy to, to not think about it. 
Um, you should always implement a custom error page, which just tells the user something went wrong. Maybe it give them a reference for them to uh, to give to you if they're going to contact you about the problem. This reference really should identify the log entry you made uh, when the uh, the problem occurred. Uh, you did implement logging, didn't you? <laughs> um, apart from looking unsightly to the user, uh, showing a stack trace or a load of tech techie words to a user can be really risky because um, they might be a user that understands what they're looking at. Um, if they're not, it's probably just going to annoy them. But um, in the error message that's shown, you could have, depending on how awful your code is, database queries showing tables, columns, usernames, passwords, anything like that. Um, it might show lines of code. So it might even just show your class. I've seen that in uh, in a few few sites and that might show the person that's looking at the page a weakness in your code that they found an exploit by reading the code that's on the screen uh, and then they can tamper with it so you've um, you're giving away a lot of information and this information that you're giving to this user is really lowering the barrier to entry for a potential hack or a potential exploit on your website so by hiding all that stuff behind a custom error page is a very, very flimsy way of protecting your, your site. And really, you shouldn't be throwing up errors to uh, to the front end if you, if you can help it. But, um, you know, sometimes errors do get through. Um, one of the nice things um, that um, I've seen um, is adding a delay to your code. Now, I don't mean your code runs slow, so you tell everyone you put a delay in there to stop the hackers from abusing your website. Um, what uh, what I mean by this is that many uh, wannabe attackers uh, rely on using a computer to relentlessly try and try again to uh, to submit forms or um, query data on it, and it's known as brute forcing. Now, they might be doing that hundreds, thousands, millions or more times um, on your site. Um, some of them will be trying to do it manually. Some of them will have written a program to do this. Um, and the computer doesn't really care how long it takes. It just keeps going. It doesn't get bored like you do. So where does this delay come in? This is a good technique to implement. And uh, the delay comes in between requests. So they make a request. Um, they need to wait a certain amount of time before they can make the next one. And if they keep making requests, that this uh, delay progressively gets longer and longer and longer and longer so if you've got a login form every time they fail the login if they're requesting it again within milliseconds or something then um, or hundredths of a second you could say well you're now going to have to wait a second and then the next time two seconds three seconds four seconds and keeps keeps going now for a normal user it would just display a little countdown or a couple of seconds they're not that bothered about that's fine uh, you can see this sort of thing been implemented on your mobile phone um, I've seen it quite a few times. It can be quite annoying, especially if your phone tries to unlock itself in your pocket using the uh, the fingerprint reader because it somehow got through the uh, the lining of your uh, of your pocket and tried to to use your your leg as your finger. You take the phone out and it says, "Please try again in two and a half hours," um, which it has happened to me, as I said, and it is frustrating. But what will happen is that um, if they're using a program to to try and log into your site that this delay is coming in, a delay is coming in, that they're actually failing to do anything because they can't submit the form, they can't submit the form, so it, it doesn't do anything. So you're actually reducing the amount of uh, traffic coming through on that form, and it reduces the uh, the impact of, of that bot. And if they're trying to do it manually, they're going to get bored pretty quick with that one. But, again, they could just edit the JavaScript, so you've got to sort of think around that as well. Another way that you could do it is uh, tracking the requests that are coming in, and lock out an account. So um, after so many failed logins or so many failed requests, you either block that account or, or lock that account, sorry, or you block that IP or something like that. And this technique's used by the likes of uh, Google Maps API. Uh, if you do too many requests too quickly, uh, they block your IP for, uh, for a period of time. Um, I think it was uh, about 24 hours. Don't ask me... Um, what I was doing to, to find that one out. But uh, yeah, they uh, they do implement that. You know, there are ways and means around these sorts of blocks. 
you know the, these requests that you're making you can stagger them you can do you, know, you put you put different amounts of time between each request you have the request coming from different ip addresses you know there are ways around it but we are just talking about the basics here to stop people from uh, from abusing your your apis or your websites and things um this next one is going to be the last one for for these these quick security tips and this is a real bugbear of mine reinventing the wheel because you can do it better you know use tried and tested solutions don't write it yourself the one thing i would say don't talk crap seriously the encryption that you wrote is not better than all the tried and tested solutions that are out there that are made by people far smarter than me far smarter than you and they've been worked on by lots of developers that are all smarter than us so you know put your trust in them you know many times i've actually sat with developers who tell me um hi i've written some encryption and it's stronger than anything that's out there and i don't use anything i only use my encryption it's the best now if that's true you wouldn't be working with me you'd be working for the government or some huge enterprise you're not you wouldn't be sitting in a small office sat there next to me scratching your head over a null reference exception now would you my, my i might have touched my own nerves there with that one but you know just sit back and think how ridiculous it sounds if you said that you're proclaiming to be better than all of the uh, the other security people out there that are writing this software you know encryption is hard to do and it's even harder to do well even some of the accepted solutions can have backdoors and loopholes and flaws in them and we do know about these but these flaws get found over time they get patched and as long as you keep it up to date it's all good but the flaws and the exploits and things that come out for for these um these security systems they're not going to be as obvious or easily exploited as anything that you will and yes will right um and uh, will be in your super encryption that you created so choose the best that you can and don't invent your own don't reinvent the wheel you know there are other security libraries out there as well to help with some of the things that we've already covered like sql injection so have a look around at what's out there um that can do a better job than you and also save you time because remember programming is not about knowing the best way to do everything it's about knowing the best way to find the best solution. Now that could be writing something, but it could be using an existing library. Don't reinvent the wheel. I've, I've said it several times. You know, don't do it. If you don't have to, don't. No one's going to look down on you because um, you used um, one of the, uh, the enterprise level uh, SQL injection uh, libraries to protect yourself instead of writing your own. No one's going to look down on you for that, unless it's one of the ones that adds a massive overhead to your uh, your project. But spend your time wisely. Spend it where it needs to be spent on your project, not on stuff that you know you can plug in. It'll work. It does the job, and it secures your application for you. Now, I've not even really scratched the surface of how to secure your software. These are just a few few tips. Um, and one thing to bear in mind is that your software will never be a hundred percent secure. But all you can do is ensure that you haven't done something really stupid, which opens up your uh, your software for the simplest of attacks. Now, if you have something to add to this list, then add a comment on the uh, the episode's webpage in the comment section. Or do you have a library that you swear by for security in your uh, in your systems? Then let us know. Add a link in the comments. Tell me about it. Come and talk to me about it if uh, if you really want to. But uh, let's make people more aware of the security sides of their application. It's not just about speeds um, and how cool looking your language is. So until next time, thank you for listening to the Cynical Developer. I'm James Studdart, and this was Securing Your Code. If you have any questions about this or any other episode, then drop us an email, a tweet, or leave a comment on the website where you can find all the resource links, show notes for each episode. And if you enjoy this episode, please leave a review on your favorite podcast platform, iTunes, Stitch, whatever it is, and help the cynical developer to reach more developers around the globe.